Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. You know, we've had a great 2015, and this is our last show for this year. This is the last day of this year, and we have two great guests on the show with us this morning. We have Janelle Cornwell and Michael Johnson, who are authors of a book, a new book out on building power. That's building cooperative power. And this is an interesting book, and we want to talk about it today. Good morning. Good morning. How are you two this morning? Great. How are you? Fantastic. Janelle, I hear you well. Mike, are you on? Uh, Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. Okay. Listen, where do you guys want to start? Because you can, we can talk about the benefits of co-ops and worker cooperatives, and we can talk about the cooperative economics and how this n- knowledge about co-ops is not known, and you call it invisible. Where, where would you like to start? What, is, what do you want people to understand about this book and about co-ops? Well, I think the best place to start is, is from the, the perspective that the book is is based on a model developed by the Valley Alliance of Worker Cooperatives in Western Massachusetts for regional cooperative economic development. We did a presentation in D.C. uh, about three weeks ago, and uh, they set up 30 chairs, and it ended up with almost 60 people there, and three or four of them had to sit in the hallway. So there's a very strong interest, it seems, in this in this business of uh, regional economic development in D.C. So that would be the best place to, to, uh, for us to focus. And I missed it that night. I had a conf- I had three three different things to do that night. Uh, so I missed it, and I'm sorry that I did. But I'm glad that a lot of people came out to hear about it. So talk to us about this Valley Alliance. What is what is that? Connecticut River Valley Alliance. What is that? That is an alliance of uh, worker cooperatives, and the way in which they structured their alliance is very much the same way that a worker cooperative is structured. That is, is that each worker co-op that's a member of the alliance is one member, and they have one vote. And this is an essential part of the model that uh, that that they've developed in in uh, in the valley. Some of the of, of the of the regional alliance of worker co-ops are developer uh, led rather than uh, worker co-op led. So this was a this was a very distinctive characteristic of the of the Bach model. So once they had they had got that established, they started reaching out to credit unions and food cooperatives, and from there they developed the Valley Alliance Business Corporation. And that is, they are now uh, collectively approaching the development of regional economic uh, economics in, in, in that area. And, of course, one of the major uh, objectives is to address this problem that uh, cooperatives simply aren't that visible. And, uh, and this, is, uh, this is where Janelle has done a, a, a lot of work. She did a lot of the, of the writing particularly around this whole issue of visibility and invisibility. Okay, so we're going we're going to stay first then with this worker cooperatives this this alliance in the Connecticut River Valley. So where is the Connecticut River Valley? What so I know it's in Connecticut, but where, what else can we tell our listeners well, where you're actually, located? Well, actually, um, it extends from southern Vermont to northern Connecticut through Massachusetts. So it's along the Connecticut River there. The Valley Alliance of Worker Co-ops has a few members in western Massachusetts, which is really the central hub, and then there's one member in southern Vermont, and there used to be a member in um, in northern Connecticut, but they have since then closed their doors, but they're in conversation with cooperatives in Connecticut as well. Okay. So that's where it is along the Connecticut River. <laughs> okay. So, okay. That's the Connecticut River Valley. All right. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay. So let's, let's go back to what is a worker cooperative? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a business that is owned um, by the people who work there, owned and managed by the people who work there. So what I normally say is any kind of business can be a cooperative if the employees own and control it, then it's a worker co-op. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Except, Vernon, I would make a distinction. There are, what, what, one of the unique features of, uh, of the worker cooperative business is there are no employers and there are no, and there are no employees. It's just worker owners. So it's, it's a really changing, uh, it's a big mind shift in, in terms of how you see yourself as an uh, economic agent. No employers, no bosses, or no and no employees. Mm-hmm. Worker owners. Okay, that that's new for me too. Mm-hmm. Okay, no employees and no employers. Right. But the so, people that work in the business own and control it. Yeah. And each person has what you talked about, which is the second rule of cooperative: they democratically control. Each member has. One share, one vote. Exactly. Okay. So you don't get people with a lot of power over each, uh, one person with a lot of power. Uh, Right. Okay. I mean, that's ideally, right? There's always informal power structures within democratic structures, but um, worker cooperatives seek to dismantle those power structures at a formal level, right? So they have to address them on an informal level. So, okay, so you have the worker cooperatives and they come together to make this alliance. How many worker cooperatives or how many cooperatives uh, started it? Well, at the very beginning, they didn't know. It was um, a group of about three or four worker co-ops, and they didn't know what other worker cooperatives existed in the region. It was a few people, members of worker co-ops, who met at a conference. And they got together, they talked, and they were like, what can we do together? We, you know, we really appreciate and feel empowered by our businesses. How can we work together to improve our businesses together and to expand this model? Mm -hmm. And um, so part of the work in the beginning was just figuring out what kind of worker co-ops were in this region (laughs) that they could work with. And um, what they found out after um, over the course of about a year, year and a half, was – that there were about 14, or actually at the time, um, 12 cooperative businesses, worker cooperatives in the region. And um, since then, not all of the cooperatives are members, but um, the Valley Alliance of Worker Co-ops has actually engaged with and facilitated the conversion of regular, traditionally owned businesses to worker co-ops. I think that they've converted four businesses. Fantastic. Yeah. It's a good record. Okay. So, for example, one uh, there was a um, alternative health uh, business in Brattleboro, and the the owner wanted to retire, and then the independent uh, uh, health people who contracted and worked there came together and and with with Box Health converted it into a worker cooperative. And so they now they now own and operate the business. Yeah, I have a property management business. I manage apartments, condos, and co-ops, and I brought this idea to the employees. There's only five employees and myself that they could become a worker cooperative. And it's, we've been working now nine months doing training to see about doing this transition. It's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy at no. all in that people have to change its mindset from an employee to – an owner mm-hmm. and I have to change the mindset from an employer to a participative owner. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, no, it's, it's, and, and that's one of the, uh, as, as a, these, the, this movement is developing and expanding a lot over the last four or five years. And, uh, that's going to be one of the major tasks of cooperative education is to help people develop the, the uh, worker owner culture within the, you know, of the various firms. And it's, it's, as you said, it's a whole shift in mindset. Well, in managing how I learned about co-ops, because uh, it is very much invisible. How I learned about co-ops was I started managing housing co-ops mm. and I really enjoyed the kind of everyday people 
struggle with the issues. <clears throat> and sometimes I have a 16 uh, unit senior co-op uh, at one point, the, probably the highest education was a high school education, yeah. but they really managed that business. They had a year long of training. And then mm -hmm. even after the year of training, um, the, the, the uh, nonprofit that was training them would come to the meetings every month and continue that training. So I really enjoyed watching them take care of business and hold each other accountable and get things done and hold me accountable. So that, and it's a very, very well run co-op because they have good governance first and then good management. Uh, so I found that governance is most important without that it's hard to even manage a co-op the way the co-op to my mind ought to function. But in, in doing that, um, I learned about co-ops and it's, it's just not well known. And I could tell you another story, but it'll take a little bit longer about this in the invisibility. And I want to get back to that as soon as we set up the structure of, of what is a worker co-op and, and this alliance. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to talk about the worker co-op. So we got that definition down and you went from three to four up to 12 and you had four conversions. And then these three or four people created this alliance similar structure as a worker co-op, I heard you understand. It still had well, one. Well, by the time that they were um, formalizing the alliance, there were many more than three people involved, right? So they had representatives, um, sometimes more than one, from each cooperative business, um, which would eventually become a member. And so now if you go to the monthly meetings, you'll have anywhere from 10 to 15 people at the meeting. And I haven't been actually to a meeting in quite some time since the research ended, but there's significantly more people involved, and it's much more formalized. They pay member dues, and they also contribute surplus to a development fund. And um, so, yeah, it began with three or four people, <laughs> but it became this much more formal thing with bylaws and um, official membership and due structure, governance structure. Well, Janelle and Michael, we have to take our first break, um, and we have three more segments to go, so we're going to try to get a lot in. This is a powerful book that you've written called Building Cooperative Power. We're going to take a break to get the weather, the news, and the traffic, and then we'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial so we can find out about how you can build power. Thanks. 1450 WOL. Welcome back, everybody. WOL's motto is information is power, and the National Cooperative Bank is bringing you this program, Everything Cooperative, to give you the information that if you use this information, you can get power, power to help your communities, power to help your families, power to help the world. And NCB's mission is to help cooperatives grow by supporting and being an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, placing special emphasis on serving the needs of communities that are economically challenged. So whether a community is economically challenged or not, what the people in the Connecticut River Valley is finding out, if they come together and create this alliance, they can build economic power. Um, so can you tell us more about how the alliance work? How, do, how does it function and what's its, what's its goals? Okay. Um, the, uh, the, the alliance is, is, is based on a model that, uh, that they, that they developed after studying, uh, the Mondragon cooperative in, uh, the Basque region of Spain. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the, the, uh, the, the very, very rich worker cooperative area in, uh, in Northern Italy. And, Basically, the idea is to to promote the development of worker cooperatives. Each cooperative contributes part of their surplus that they that they've earned during the course of the year, and that money goes into to a development fund, and then that money is used to uh, to help uh, like conversions or there's a new uh, group of people that are forming their uh, a brand new worker co-op. That money is used to help them get uh, get started. So that's one of the core that's one of the core things of that uh, of, of that model. And then the the other one we mentioned already the one member one vote. So that it's a worker co-op led alliance. And then the, the a third element in the model is to connect regionally with with the various other kinds of uh, 
of cooperatives, uh, uh, credit unions, food cooperatives, and even even uh, producer cooperatives like uh, like uh, uh, the ones that get together to with farm products. Okay, so that sounds like principle number six mm-hmm. in the cooperative oh, principle: absolutely. cooperation among cooperatives. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, huge. So I've heard you talk about uh, principle number two, which is um, this democratic one member, one vote, and principle number six. I don't see a principle for this donating part of your excess, part of your profit, if you will. I put that in quotes, but your surplus. Uh, I don't think there's a principle. We might want to create a number eight principle here <laughs> of how you can help this model grow by people coming together and putting money in. Okay. I did not know that about Mondragon. I've, I've had people on the show that talks about Mondragon and I want to go there one day and see how this thing works, particularly when this preacher rides into town on a bicycle and tell people about the, <laughs> about the worker cooperative. And, and I thought, what is there? I forgot how many 70,000 employees and 110 businesses or the numbers are not right, but it's huge. In this, in this region. It's something like 85,000 worker cooperators, members. That's what you okay. It's like 100 employees. Yeah, it's great. And uh, they have a university and a bank. Yeah. So good. <laughs> okay. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you're, you're modeling after them, and people are pooling their money together to help either new co-ops or convert existing businesses uh, to co-ops. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Bach has also borrowed from um, co-ops in Italy, especially northern Italy, where the cooperatives got pretty big and actually influenced government to to say that in order to be a cooperative, you have to contribute 3% of your profit or your surplus to a cooperative development association. And so they have this law in place as um, in order to be a co-op in Italy, considered a co-op, you have to do that. And so the difference between the Madrigan cooperatives and the cooperatives in Italy is the Italian cooperatives tend to be much smaller, they're more diverse, um, and they're not as sort of hierarchically structured um, in terms of their association. The Madrigan cooperatives, it's very centralized, right? Mm-hmm. And so they've borrowed, the Vauk uh, Alliance here in, in western New England has borrowed from, from the Italian cooperatives as well. Okay, okay. Yeah. And I, I, think, uh, I think the idea of, it, of uh, uh, co-op coming together to invest in, in a de- development fund is very much with the, uh, the six principles. It's, you know, it's just a way to facilitate the, the cooperative is you can start to develop more cooperatives, and then everyone is getting stronger with a, with a larger base that's, in, that's uh, working together. Yeah. So since we've talked about uh, the principles, I'd like to go ahead and tell listeners that maybe have not heard them. If they've listened to the show, they've, they've probably heard them before. But the first one is volunteer and open membership. That's one of the things that caught my eye being African-American is that in this business, it's open to everybody and, and anybody – not depending on politics or race or gender, it, it, nothing. It's just it's open if you want to join. Uh, there may be some other criteria, but it's not any of those. So I like that. And then the second was democratic member control. The third is members' economic participation. You put money in, and when and if there's a surplus, you take money out. But the other part of it is autonomous and independence is the fourth one, mm-hmm. and that the people, the members, decide how much will st- – of the surplus will stay in the business and how much will go to forming other businesses or, or uh, how much will go to the, to the members. That's and, exactly important. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, fifth one is education, training, and information. This was the number of one reason I, in, I liked uh, and like love now uh, cooperatives is this thing of education, training, and information. And I've gone to different, Workshop, just like you, you said, this group started forming at a workshop, this three or four, but I really like the way people share data, share information. They don't sort of hold on to it like this is, you know, this is critical knowledge, and if I give it away, somehow I'm going to give away my customers or something. Uh, mm-hmm. People share uh, easily in, in a cooperative world. And the sixth one, we've talked about cooperation among cooperatives. And the seventh one I like a lot is concern for community. It says uh, uh, a co-op could have a uh, 
vice president of social responsibility or a group of social responsibility, but it's built into the DNA of a co-op, which is seventh principle, uh, really concerned for the community and and how the community functions and how the business can impact that community. So how did you guys get involved in co-ops, by the way? <laughs> I got – okay. go ahead, Janelle. You're, no, you're no, go ahead. Michael. Right. Okay. So I belong to a different kind of, of a cooperative. It's not technically called that. It's, it's an intentional community in uh, Staten Island, New York. And an intentional community is people living and working together. Uh, and and it's their, their intent to do that together and, 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 and to develop kind of a, a sense of family, but self-selected family. And we had done a lot of work on creating a cooperative culture. And um, we started back in 1980, and we're, and, and we're, and we're still working at it because it's not an easy thing to do. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to – we had learned a lot, and I wanted to see how this might, you know, extend out into the larger political arena. And I got connected with, uh, with, with some of the Valley Alliance people at a conference in, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, and then asked if it was okay if I come and would come up to do research because I wanted to interview. So I was over a period of about three years. I was interviewing people, you know, about about forty people all together, current worker cooperatives and people who had been in in the seventies. And then uh, you know Janelle was doing her thing, and then someone came up to the idea, well, why don't you guys pull all of this together, and the the and the evolution of Vox and write a book about all of this. And so there was about four or five of us that got started on it. And uh, that's how I was was part of it. So, Janelle, how did you get involved? Yeah, um, it was in the context of a graduate program at the University of Massachusetts. One of the uh, early VOC organizers had had a professor in college, and um, she introduced me. She was my advisor. She introduced me to him and to the movement. And so I began going to meetings really early on and – Absolutely just being most interested among the things that I was looking at in college, being most interested in the worker co-ops and thinking, well, geez, halfway through I wanted to stop college and just <laughs> begin a worker co-op because it made so much more sense. So, Well, I, I tell you, Janelle, I really wish I had learned this in college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. <laughs> yeah. I think many, 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 many more people should <laughs> in high school. <laughs> Well, let's go to grade school. I I did talk to Michael Bell, who is on NCBA, Mm. uh, and his both of his parents were um, in credit unions, and he said at the age of eleven he could help people fill out their their loan forms. So he I I called him a a co op baby and said, okay, that would even been better to to get it that early. Right. But this co op world, and we're going to we got to take our next break. We're going. I really want to talk about this in in invisible part that's that's not known it's there's and that's why ncb uh helped to sponsor this program just want people to know about co-ops um and the benefits of them uh but we're going to take another break uh to get the news and the weather and everything and then we'll be right back to i want to get into this in the invisible we'll be right back please don't touch your dial okay Fourteen fifty W O L. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks and with Everything Cooperatives, and we have two persons on our uh, show this morning: Janelle Cornwell and Michael Johnson, who have written a book called "Building Cooperative Power." Uh, fascinating, fascinating book. But you can get it on uh, Kindle. I was out of town um, this week. And so I went on Kindle and bought it so I could do some reading up on it before, because I left a co- my copy here. Mm-hmm. Um, poor planning, but it only costs 10 bucks on Kindle, so that's one way of getting this powerful book, a lot of information. And let me set this up for you on this in, invisible in of this co-op. I told you I, I did, I found about co-ops by managing them, of uh, housing co-ops. So I joined an organization called the National Association of Housing Co-ops, and I was in this a committee called Development and Preservation of Housing Co-ops. 
and I had two guys. One is 96 now, Roger Wilcox, uh, up in Connecticut. And um, Herbert Fisher is a lawyer in Chicago, about 85, 86 years old. So these two guys for about four or five years kept telling me and this our committee, if we can get developers to build housing co-ops, then people will buy them. And so we put all of our effort in trying to get developers to build them with little success. And so one day after hearing this and having taught marketing, I said to them, you, most people don't know about co-ops. And you've got to get promote co-ops. And if you promote co-ops and get people to understand them and the value of them and all of the benefits of co-ops, then people will demand them and, de- and developers will build them. Without the demand, developers are not going to build them. Mm. And and it's really clear. Uh, National Co-op Bank did some studies and brought some groups in and asked them questions, 25 to 45-year-old buppies and yuppies, and they didn't know anything about co-ops. But ten, I, li- I said in a one here in D.C., they were about five cities, these focus groups. People just didn't. And so it proved my, my point to this committee is people don't know about co-ops. It's just invisible. So how did you all come up with this and what did you study? And I'd like for you to tell people out here, why do you think it's so invisible? Hmm. Good question. (laughs) (laughs) I have a hypothesis, but. (laughs) (laughs) Hmm. Well, I mean, I don't, first of all, I don't think you should, um, you should be in graduate school before you uh, understand and realize that, that credit unions are cooperatives. (laughs) Yes. Um, I didn't know the difference literally until um, I was in graduate school. That's just wrong. Um, I, I didn't know there were any other options besides corporate, private, investor-led, and owned banks. So, I mean, there are many theories, um, but I think one of the consequences of invisibility is that we don't understand our own power. When we're u- using our dollars to spend money, those dollars can go to wherever. If you don't know the difference between a cooperative bank, for example, and credit union on the other side, then um, if you don't know the difference, then you're not going to make an informed choice, right? If you're going to start a business and you don't know what a worker co-op is, it's not going to enter your mind uh, as an option. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I I mean, I I couldn't begin to, to suggest where or why we are not educated in this frame and um, about cooperatives, but certainly those in power with the most money, the 1%, they benefit. <laughs> By us not knowing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think one of the um, key factors in, in this is is that in, in our society, we, we have this, I, you know, you ask somebody, well, how's the economy doing? What do you think about the economy? And of course, the economy means the, the you know the, the the capitalist economy that you know you get the, all the reports on et cetera et cetera. What people don't understand is is that if you think of a of a iceberg, mm. that part of the economic activity in in the United States or any other society, the capitalist thing is is what sticks up out of the water that ten percent. Below that, there's this whole world, universes of economic activity, uh, households, uh, barg- uh, 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 bargaining, gift economy, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, so if you go to a business school, all they're going to talk about is is the capitalist economy. Mm-hmm. And, and so there is no place, in, in for the most part, in the economic departments, in the business schools, in the universities, to talk about anything else but, the, you know, the, the, the capitalist economy, mm-hmm. and with one exception, and that exception is the econ department at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which has has allied with with Bach in in and a, and a network of food co-ops, creating a, a cooperative economic collaborative, and they now teach courses in, in University of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, on the, the history of the worker cooperatives, uh, the, the the nature of cooperative economics, uh, et cetera. So if the schools and the newspapers and the media are not thinking in terms of a much larger concept of economy and economics, then you're not going to hear about any of those other things. And so your cooperative economics becomes invisible. Because, for example, 
there are 111 million members of cooperatives in the United States. Say that one more time. A hundred and what? A hundred. Here's a University of Wisconsin study. One hundred and eleven million. Mm-hmm. And there's and there's about something like forty six million people who have investments in the stock market. Now, you would think somehow that would all be visible, but it isn't. And and the consequences of that invisibility is uh is you know, is major because you don't know different options. That's what you were describing, Vernon, was was that you're trying to sell the idea of housing co-ops, and you can't do it because the people you're talking to don't even have a, a, a picture and never heard of a, a cooperatives. And that's so in D.C. I found out you that. We produced a cooperative model in, in different ways because no one knows about it because it's, it, it's not presented in in the normal course of uh, media or, or, or college education or high schools. No, and that's, and, that's real sad. I, and my hypothesis, and uh, Janelle was hitting on it, uh, my hypothesis was the one percenters, the people that have a lot of money, the billionaires, uh, they don't want people to know about this model, this cooperative model, because it's in their total benefit to have the business schools and the lit law schools um, to only talk about this capitalistic model. Now, I got my I got my MBA at Stanford University, <laughs> and I like Stanford a lot. But when I look at what they teach, everything, every decision was was talked about was return on investment. Mm-hmm. Okay, what's the re- R- uh, ROI? What's the return on investment? And so that the, the total focus was what's the benefit to the shareholders? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's and the shareholder most likely did not live in the community, may did not work in the community. They may even been out of the country. Uh, but you're looking at what's the best benefit for those people, then that's the people that had capital. Not the everyday person, like I was talking about, that live in these housing co-ops and these uh, low-income uh, housing co-ops. Um, it's not like what's the benefit for everyday people. Mm. It's just not what it was about. Or what's the benefit for the employees? Okay, no, that wasn't, <laughs> those were not the issues. Um, and I only really got the, the distinct contrast when we started talking about co-ops. How what that total difference is. So yeah, that's and how do we change that? So my hypothesis is there are people would call co ops this is what they, they told me these two older gentlemen, they they called it socialism uh, or communism. They put all of these terms on this and it's the most democratic uh, institution that I have seen mm-hmm. because of this one right. member, one vote. You don't have all of this power. Mm-hmm. Uh th- that we see in our own system with um how you can buy election with these super PACs. You don't have that. Have a level playing field. Love it. Okay. <laughs> I think there's a lot to your hypothesis, but there's there's also another very powerful factor, the ugly. Um, I worked in a public school district in Texas and uh, and became automatically became a member of the of the credit union that, uh, that, that was associated with that school district. I thought it was just a groovy bank. Hey, yeah. No one within <laughs> that uh, that uh, that credit union did anything to inform people what it meant to be a member of a credit union, how credit unions were different, how they were cooperatives, how they related to food cooperatives, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the the problem of visibility is not only outside, yeah. but it's inside. I never understood, you know, it wasn't until I was doing this research 30 years later that I, you know, you need a credit union as a cooperative? Mm-hmm. Hello? Mm-hmm. You know? So, so it, that's a big, a big factor also. Well, I tried very hard to get into the credit union early in, in my life, in my career, and I couldn't until... I don't know when the first one, but I know I taught at Howard University and I was sort of like not necessarily automatic, but it was automatic once you applied. I didn't know that it was a co-op. I knew that there, you could run for the board and I would, there was one lady in our, in the business school where I taught that was a, a, a um, secretary and she was on the board and she ran for the board, but that was all I knew about it. I didn't know that the board controlled it. I did not know about, I had a, any other say other than 
electing this person, but nowhere, nowhere at all, this concept of co-op. Now, I'm glad you guys are on, and I'm, I don't want to talk too much, but <laughs> you all are hitting all of my buttons today with your book. I love it's, it. It's, okay. Bernard, I just want to jump in real quick. Go ahead. There's a third co-author who couldn't be here. His name is Adam Trott. And 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 he, he he's one of the, uh, the the very strong activists you know, who who's been hot behind the development of the alliance and the whole regional model. He's a staff member of the Valley Alliance of Worker Co-ops and also a Collective Copies member. Okay, and you spell it T R O T T, Adam. Yep, that's right. Okay. That's right. <laughs> At in National Co-op Bank's annual meeting this past year. Uh, Chuck Snyder, who's the president, allowed me to speak, and I encourage everybody there, I particularly shout out to the credit unions that put their advertisement, put something in it about your co-op, and secondly, put something in some of those ads about what the benefits of co-ops are. We haven't won that fight yet. (laughs) (laughs) We haven't won that battle yet. But it's all of the big ones, um, uh, how we can get this, this message out. Now, NCBA CLUSA, is having their hundredth year anniversary this year in sixteen, mm. and so they're want to lay out a spread of advertisement out this whole year, looking at specific segments of co-ops, and so maybe we can get you guys and we can work together to try to get this this knowledge out about about co-ops. Would love to. Now, what are some of the consequences of this invisibility? You mentioned one of them is you don't have inf- informed choice. Mm-hmm. What are some right. of the other consequences? Well, one of the consequences is, um, is for management of cooperatives themselves. Where can they go to, to find education? As you mentioned, you got a degree in business from Stanford, right? Yeah. And yeah. you didn't learn. I mean, so you're a top manager. You didn't learn about cooperatives. So if a cooperative wants to hire a manager, where do they look for a pool of qualified candidates who know about management in cooperatives? That's a big problem and a big consequence in terms of cooperative management. Yes. Um, and I'm looking here that it's hard to get money to invest in co-ops. So. Yes, totally. Because uh, <clears throat> if people don't know them, they're not going to put their money in them. Right. Um, and this fourth consequence that we've listed in the fifth chapter of the, or sorry, sixth chapter of the book, is isolation of co-ops by sector, and that's addressing that six cooperative principles, right? If cooperatives can't see each other, they're going to be isolated and therefore less strong. They won't be as powerful on their own as they could be together, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And that's that's a huge consequence. So if you have a huge cooperative sector like the federal credit unions and um, the smaller credit unions not identifying as cooperatives – um, they may be collaborating with each other, but they're missing out on collaborating with this, these other giant and smaller sectors of cooperatives. We'll be right back, guys. Uh, we only have one more segment to go, but we'll be right back to talk more about uh, building cooperative power. 1450 WOL. Information is power. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks on Everything Cooperative. Information is power. We're talking about worker cooperatives, and we said if it's uh, controlled, if the business is owned and controlled by the people that work there. <laughs> okay, I'm changing, Michael. The people that work are, are called worker owners. They're not employers, and they're not employees. They own the business. Uh, there's the other type, which we've been talking about, and that's consumer cooperatives, and that's if the people that own and control the business use the products or services like credit unions and housing co-ops. And we had on the show one day, one of the board members from a um, clinic, a health clinic that the patients owned it. And that creates a whole different dynamics in the business when the focus is on patients and not on, uh, what was that? Return on investment. (laughs) Okay. Mike and Janelle, you mentioned the politics and I'd just like to change the conversation a little bit to talk about, politics um local and regional and if you all would maybe want to talk about who you think would be the best president for cooperatives (laughs) 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 i don't want to put you on a spot or anything we can start local how's it going 
what do you have to do locally? You talked about in Italy, they changed the law that if you're going to be a cooperative, you have to put 3% in so that you can help develop other co-ops, which would be great. I mean, but some of the laws, I know some of the laws in different places is housing co-ops. Uh, it, it's hard to get them in because the laws don't, don't call for them. So w- what do you think politically we need to do to try to get this not to be so invisible? Well, well, I mean, in my personal sphere at the University of um, at Worcester State University, I'm doing little things and trying to make connections in the School of Business, um, get it, get classes approved. So I think each person in their own political world, and then in their broader political world. So one thing you can do is you can vote every two to four years, right? Mm-hmm. And then another thing you can do is just look for those spaces of opportunity in your own world to connect with other people who are interested in co-ops and to learn about co-ops and and. In my case, you know, if I can make some sort of change in the school of business, I will be elated. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll be like a little mini revolution. <laughs> um, uh, but Vok has done that. So that's one of the important things about collaborating is together that we can do so much more. And you see what the businesses in Western Massachusetts have done. And it's just um, it's pretty amazing. Michael might have more to say about the political aspect in terms of what's happened in New York City with um, the allocation of, I think it's $2 million to worker co-op development in particular. You want to talk about that, Mike? Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I, want, I want to note that uh, in uh, the state of Massachusetts, it's possible to, uh, uh, to, form, to legally form a worker cooperative. So the government has, has, has been brought in, and it was it was it was this was done by the movement to bring them in to set up a, a special category called a worker cooperative. Now, I don't think there's any other state in the country that has that. So p- politically, that is one way in in in, in which the, the the cooperative movement can uh, can serve itself. In 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 New York City, I think the story in New York City. Suggests, you know, the, the, the complications involved in getting the the, the government involved with, with uh, in regards to money. The um, the New York City Council is putting in two to three million dollars a year over the last year and, and, and this year in, in helping to develop worker cooperatives. But it was done in, in a framework that was, you know, it was called, you know, job uh, work, a job development. So. You're already in a in a different framework than than the cooperative framework in, 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 when you're starting to deal with, with with getting those kinds of resources, and because they're being where the movement is so starved for money that when you start getting this kind of money, you know it's like you want to be very careful about how dependent you get on it. You, you're in tricky waters already. Because, uh, like, for example, in New York City, uh, the, the woman who, who initiated this uh, city council support for worker cooperatives had to resign. So she's not there anymore. And I don't know how that's all going to play out. But it, it is like, you know, you're, you're in, that, in, that, uh, in that river, you know, that has very, very intense negotiations going on all the time many levels of complexity and so it's not all it's you know it's a bed of roses you know and the thorns you know are going with that so it's it's a very tricky thing overall i think the most important thing to do is to build a very cohesive movement of all the cooperatives and and all of the alternative forms of uh of economics uh land grants and pension communities uh, ESOPs, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, to 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 develop a very cohesive, solid, stable, growing movement is is you know, I think the, uh, the ground floor of any way to 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 operate in in the larger political world for our movement. Yeah, New York has got that money, and in Madison, Wisconsin, they put up a million dollars a year for five years to create worker cooperatives. So. Right. This community wealth building, the Democratic Collaborative here in Maryland has just brought out a book on community wealth building, and they've looked at 10, 20 cities that are building wealth through cooperatives. I 
didn't go back to look if the uh, Connecticut River Valley was a part of it. I'm pretty sure it was not. It may have been a city up that way that they, that was in this book. Um, yeah. But if you haven't seen this book, you can go on um, the webpage for Democracy, Democracy Collaborative, and it, it is on the webpage in di- digital form, but you could also order that book. Uh, it's a nice read. What's the name of the book? Um, building Community Wealth. Community Wealth Building. I was looking for my copy, but I had taken it out of my bag because your book and that book are my two reads right now. Mm-hmm. And Jessica Gordon Imrod's uh, Collective Courage. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Those are my three books. Nobody touched what president, candidate, oh, I'm Republican or Democrat would be best I for the corporate so movement. I'm so disgusted by the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I really am, um, and I'm sure something has happened since the last time I heard anything on the radio or saw the newspaper. You know, I'm I just am a little bit leery of even the ones that seem good. Um, I have to say, I mean, I guess Bernie Sanders is the most radical, but I'm not really entirely sure how he could be. But um, yeah, so. <laughs> Um, what do you think? You didn't touch it either. Michael, she's talking to you. No. <laughs> I, you I, I'll, I'll tell you where I am. I'll tell you. I, I'm, pre- I'm pretty much where, where, where Janelle is. And, and for example, if, uh, uh, in the primary in New York, I will vote for Bernie Sanders, but I'm not taking that in, you know, any more, the, the only seriousness I, I connect to that, to the co- uh, cooperative and solidarity movement, is that that's going to provide an easier landscape for us to build our movement. Uh, I'm not thinking of any kind of direct uh, support that would come from that, but there'd be all kinds of indirect things that would be helpful. Whereas, you know, if Trump is in, God knows what's going to happen. Well, we have to turn it to God if he gets in, but I, I can't see that. Uh, but I guess we got to get out and, 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 uh, because when you talk about return on investment, he's the epitome of that capitalistic model mm-hmm. and, and what, what that all brings in terms of greed and not looking at, if you read his books, I mean, it, it he has some striking things in there about how you do a deal, for example. So mm-hmm. I don't think I would, want him to be president just on his books alone, let alone the stuff that he says and hate that he creates. But it's been a huge struggle between uh, Hillary and Bernie, and I've just gone to Bernie, and I'm going to get out and start working for him because I think he would be the best choice from everything that we're talking about here. When you look at this gap in the wealth, this what the one percenters have, and I've done a couple shows just talking about that the difference in the wealth building and why this cooperative model is so good for the the, the people in the 80% and below of creating not only financial wealth, but social wealth and well-being and health and all of that stuff, all of the, the things and where people will have a say and know that they have a say in what goes on and their vote truly will count. So I, I don't, I don't know. I haven't gotten as far as you two have about whether or not, if he's a president, it will really make a difference in this cooperative movement. But at least he's talking about the things and he's running his candidacy without the PACs and without the big money, so he won't be aligned to them. So I'm hopeful he'll be aligned to the people. I don't expect him to win the primary, but I think the stronger showing that he has is 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 going to, to, to give more substance to the, to the center left. And the center left is going to be more supportive, directly or indirectly, to uh, the, the cooperative movement. Okay. Well, we only have about 30 seconds. Do you have anything else you want to say to close it off, either one of you? I just really appreciate you having us on. Thank you so much, Vernon. Thank you guys for coming on. And we only, we didn't even hardly touch the book. I wanted to get into the, the different types of the worker cooperatives that you have. But, so we'll try to get you back on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so very much for your work. This is it's a great conversation you, you you conduct. I like that a lot. Thank you. You guys have a great week and a happy new year. You too. And let's promote co ops. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bye now. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Fourteen fifty W O L.